Leviticus chapter 22. You know, we've been talking about the priesthood a lot uh, in Leviticus, especially in the last few chapters. And while we're still talking about the priests specifically, or the Levites, um, tonight I'm going to make this more about us. Two things to remember. One, we are a royal priesthood. And we've studied these things so many times. The repetition is important, but the application, the emphasis is going to be on what that means for us. And that's the second thing. Ask the Lord, what's he trying to say to you in this Leviticus chapter 22 Bible study? Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight. One of the things that we're going to talk about, Lord, is thank offerings or free will offerings and the right way to present those thank offerings to you. Spirit of God, would you examine our hearts? Let's be honest. Our hearts open. And deal with every man, every woman here, everybody watching online, Lord. By the power of your spirit, have your way in every heart. I do pray, Lord, though it's unlikely, on a Wednesday night Bible study in Leviticus, if you've brought an unbeliever here, somebody who's rejected Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross, if you've brought somebody here whose life is really hurting and empty and they found their way here tonight, well, we know that was your divine design, Lord. So draw them to you and add to your family. We love you, Jesus. We're grateful for all that you've done. Now, by the power of your spirit, Teach us. Too much is given. Much is required. We are a royal priesthood. Oh God, thank you because we truly have been given much. We pray all of this because of Jesus. Amen. I want to start tonight with a true story out of Houston, Texas. It's an old car business story. I don't know how long in the past this was, but it was a story that had been circulating. It was a, a car dealer in Houston. I think, if memory serves, it was a Dodge dealer. That really isn't important to the story. But he was a backslidden Christian. Raised in church, served the Lord, but you know, as he got more and more successful, it's easy to sort of slide away, and that's exactly what happened. And while he was away from the Lord, he'd done some things that you ought not to do, of course. One day in the dealership that he owns, this older couple, I always feel weird about saying that now because they're probably younger than I am. But this older couple comes in and they want to buy a new car. It was a big deal for them. They've had the same old car for a long time. <clears throat> and the car that they were going to trade in was in pristine condition. It's one of those little old lady from Pasadena cars, you know, a used car that everybody wants and you can hardly ever find them. And they were just going to do this. It was their treat to themselves. They were going to buy a new car. They ordered it. Everything was fine. They settled on a price for their used car. And then they drove their used car home and waited for the car to come in. Well, when it came in, actually in the time before it came in, they met a young family that was really hurting. They didn't have any transportation. And the husband and wife began talking and thinking, we could do something to help them. And the Lord sort of led them to offer their old car. It's in really good shape. We'll make sure it goes to the dealership and they can make sure everything is perfect in it. But we'd like to give it to you. And of course, the young family was sort of flabbergasted. And well, well, we didn't expect anybody to do anything like this. And it gave them an opportunity to share Jesus. And so that's what they did. Well, they got a call that their new car had arrived. And they went in to get it. And they had to tell the salesman that the car that they were going to trade in is now out of the deal. We'll replace that with money. It's just out of the deal, and we'll pay cash for the car that you have. 
And the salesman, because everybody wanted the car, went to his manager and said, well, well we really wanted that trade-in. Is there any way we can do it? And so the manager came to talk to the older couple. And the old couple explained to them exactly what they were going to do. They were going to give the old car to somebody else. But by the time they went in to pick up the car, things had changed a little bit more because God began working on the old couple's heart. And God was reminding them, you know, when you give something for me, you need to give your best. So here's what I want you to do. You give them the new car. And you keep the old one. And they were happy to do that. They'd heard from the Lord. They knew exactly what they were going to do. And so in telling the story to the manager, the manager was so moved that he went in and told the dealer, the backslidden Christian, what this couple was going to do. And he said, well, I've got to meet them. And he went out and introduced himself to them. And he asked him, why are you doing it? Well, you know, we really don't need a new car, and this young family, they needed it. We were going to give them the old car, the trade-in, and it's in really good condition, but, but we can't give them that car because the Lord wanted to give them the newer car. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay for it, and you sign all of the paperwork, not to us, but to them instead, title and everything in their name. And we believe that's what Jesus wants us to do, and we love the Lord. Again, another opportunity to witness. The car dealer went back to his office and broke down. He broke down. The Holy Spirit had so convicted him of that. He said, as he came back out to the old couple, he said, you know, if you don't mind. And he explained, I'm a backslidden Christian. I love Jesus. I've always was always raised, but I just haven't been doing the right things for a very long time. And when I saw what you were doing, when I saw your generosity, it just moved my heart. And as soon as I got back to my office, the Holy Spirit convicted me, and I need to get right with God. So thank you so much. And in fact, here's how I'm going to thank you. I'm going to give both of you a brand new car. Nobody pays for it. We'll take the old car, and you guys both get two new cars. You see, that's what happens when you know how to give to God. Because we're a royal priesthood, we're not like other people. Because we're a royal priesthood, we have an obligation to give God our absolute best at all times. No shortcuts, no taking the easy way out. We need to be like King David when he said after his horrible sin of counting the troops of Israel, he said, I will not give that to the Lord which costs nothing. God is always at work, and we need to understand how we can approach the Lord and expect that he's going to do something in our hearts. Two brand new cars for free, pretty good deal, but it's just one more demonstration that you can never outgive God. Remember your royal priesthood, so I'm not just talking about modern day priests or pastors or church leaders. But we're talking about every single one of us here, and there are different applications, but the Spirit of God will convict you as it relates to your life. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons to treat with respect. Now, if you have a King James or a New King James, it says that they're to separate themselves. All of the newer translations use treat with respect, and I think that's better. It's a very difficult Hebrew word. And so the definitions are a little bit uncertain, but the context seems to be treat with respect the offerings that the people are bringing to the Lord. Treat with respect the sacred offerings the Israelites consecrate to me, so they will not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. Now, nine times in this chapter, we're going to get I am the Lord. Now, in our last four chapters of Leviticus, over and over and over, God has made the point, I'm the Lord, I'm in charge, I make the rules. You have no right to change the rules. You have no right to question why. I'm in charge, I make the rules, you're my servant, and you're to follow the rules. Well, that continues throughout the rest of the book of Leviticus. 
It's almost as though the Holy Spirit is anticipating that we're going to say, well, that doesn't make sense. Why, why is that there? And the answer is, I'm the Lord. I think of Job suffering beyond anything that we can possibly imagine. And the whole book of Job is about the question, why? But God never answers that question. God simply, in the book of Job, reveals more of himself to Job. And at the end, Job, in sackcloth and ashes, says, you know, I thought I knew him, but now I've seen him. And he repents for even questioning the Lord. I am the Lord nine times in this chapter. Say to them, this is the Levites, say to the Levites, for the generations to come, if any of your descendant is ceremony, if any of your descendants is ceremonially unclean, and yet comes near the sacred offerings that the Israelites consecrate to the Lord, that person must be cut off from my presence. Here it is again. I am the Lord. Now, obviously, we would understand that they're thinking of Nadab and Abihu, who offered strange fire to the Lord, and it cost them their lives. God's making a point. I'm the Lord. Don't question what I'm asking you to do. Just be obedient. Later in Israel's history, I think of Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, who were stealing from the offerings that were done, who were taking advantage of some of the women, who were bringing the offerings. And of course, they paid with their life as well. Now, the priests, the Levites, were to recognize that the offerings given to God by the people belonged to God. They were never to benefit personally from those offerings. They were never to, to sort of, well, you know, nobody's looking now, so we can just take the meat. That's what Hophni and Phinehas did. They would pick a big fork and stick it in, and, and they would take meat that wasn't for them. And they would utilize it. They were never to benefit personally from their offerings, the offerings that were presented to the Lord in their day-to-day -day service. Now, this is a very timely chapter for the world that we live in because we see a lot of people, pastors, church leaders, who are benefiting personally, benefiting in some cases in the extreme, in their service for the Lord. Well, if you're benefiting from your service for the Lord, you're really no longer a servant. Now, God blesses, and I'm not diminishing the fact that God will bless. But the pastors that are living extravagant lives, the pastors that are living at a means well above the people in their congregation, at that point, they cease to become servants at all. Now, clearly, I think human nature has never changed. From the time Adam and Eve sinned, human nature has been to look out for ourselves, to take advantage of things and do things that would benefit us rather than other people. In our church culture today, we who are pastors, we need to remember that the church is not our personal ATM. It's not to be used for our benefit only as the Lord leads and that's a sentiment that we've kind of lost in this day and age. We need to be sure to ask God what he wants to do with the offerings. Now, I'm going to make this personal a little bit, at least as it relates to our church, because God has given us an unusual vision of ministry. You all are aware of that. Everything that we do here is free whether it's a free school, free doctor's office, the free restaurant when we get into the new building, um, um, all of the free stuff that we do, we do it because this is God's desire. God's the one who chooses. I never said, you know, Lord, I think I'm going to be a really generous person. Proverbs 25 says, if you're God will bless a prosperous man. Well, okay, Lord, bless me. It's never been that kind of thing. He gives orders. We take the orders. Why? Because he is the Lord. And so here at Calvary Chapel, we have tried our best to make sure 
that we've been faithful to the vision that God has given us. And all of you can see, it's the easiest thing in the world. None of the money that you provide, none of the time, none of the service that you provide, and all of these things are offerings. None of that has gone to enrich anybody here at Calvary Chapel. Other than this extravagant building that we're in, and I say that laughing, with a few tears, it's clear that we spend God's money in the way he wants it spent. Nobody at this church, our staff, I don't know, 33, 34 people, nobody here is getting rich at Calvary Chapel. Because the money belongs to God. Now, I reminded you, you're a royal priesthood. What about your money? What about your resources? Are you honoring the Lord with the blessings in your life. Now, you know, we don't ask for money here. We never will. But what we need to do is come to grips with the fact that our money is not our money. It all belongs to the Lord. That's what Romans chapter 12 says. Offer your bodies, that's all of you in totality, as a living sacrifice. We'll open our hands and say, okay, Lord, here's your money. This is how much you've allowed me to be a steward of. What do you want to do with it? I promise she's going to let you keep most of it. But if we're going to honor our gifts, we've got to ask him what he wants us to do with it. We don't get a vote. We don't get to say so. It's so easy to say, well, I'll give 10%. Think about the absurdity for a moment of saying, okay, Jesus, here's ten one dollar bills. One for you, nine for me. But that's what we do. And the reason we do it is because we don't want to ask the Lord, what is it that you want us to give? So remember, the gifts are from God. They belong to God. That's the wonderful, wonderful benefit of living in a time of grace. Now it gets a little more personal here. Verse 4. If a descendant of Aaron has an infectious skin disease, leprosy is what's in view here. Leprosy, remember, is a type of sin. If a descendant of Aaron has an infectious skin disease or a bodily discharge, he may not eat the sacred offerings, offerings until he is cleansed. He will also be unclean if he touches something defiled by a corpse or by anyone who has an emission of semen or if he touches any crawling thing that makes him unclean, or any person who makes him unclean, whatever the uncleanness may be. Now, I want to focus on the leprosy. Leprosy, I've always told you when you see it in the Old Testament, is a type of sin. It starts out really small, usually in the appendages, and then it spreads. Well, that's exactly what sin does for us. And it says that if you have an infectious disease, you may not eat the sacred offerings. Well, in the same way, when we're dabbling around with sin, we're cut off from the presence of the Lord. If there is unconfessed, unrepentant sin in our lives, then we have no relationship with the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean you're not saved. I, I want you to understand that. But it means that he is effectively cut off from being able to be an active force in your life. It's sort of like you're surrounding yourself with a field of sin and, and the Lord simply can't penetrate it. He wants to draw near to you. He wants to bless you. But the reality is, because of your sin, because of your refusal to repent, He can't do it. Now, all these things, it's not just the, the, the infectious skin disease. There's nothing anybody could do about that. But there's also sin that keeps us from the Lord. And we'll see it's called unintentional sin in a couple of moments. There are things that we are involved in that God simply doesn't want us involved in. And because this is about thank offerings, this is about treating the gift of God in a way that honors the Lord, we need to be sure that we examine our hearts every day. I think this is another timely warning. We need to approach our work whatever it is God's called you to do. Not just your work serving the church, but, but your jobs, 
the relationships that you have. We need to approach all of those things with a sense of awe, even fear, and never presume that what we're doing is somehow okay with the Lord. You know, the reason Paul says that we're to examine our lives, our hearts daily, is because he knows that if we're not examining our hearts daily, that sin factor will just add up. And as it adds up, we'll get to the point where our hearts get hard enough, we'll just say, well, well, it's okay now. God understands me. We need to keep our lives in a position where Jesus is always welcome, where Jesus can always cleanse us. We're all aware of the many, many public figures, pastors in the church who have fallen into sin and disqualified themselves from ministry. Now, disqualifying themselves from ministry is being cut off. That's a punishment. But far worse is being cut off from God himself, from the presence of the Lord. Here at Calvary Chapel, we tell you all the time to just be with Jesus. Imagine if you couldn't. That moment when you really need him and you're crying out, where are you, Lord? The answer is, well, he's tried to draw near to you, but, but you keep him at a distance. And as I said, we're well aware of the many, many public people who brought shame to the name of the Lord by falling into all kinds of sin and to disqualify themselves from ministry, to be unable to do the thing that you're gifted to do, the privilege that we have as pastors. I mean, those are severe consequences. Our walk with Jesus matters. It's not just our gifting but it's our walk with the Lord. And if we get too close to sin, if we begin practicing sin, every one of us can lose the privilege of our calling. I can't imagine what it would be like to get up in the morning and, and, and just feel the distance from the Lord. I can't imagine what it would be like to be cut off. I can't imagine what my life would be like if I couldn't do what I do. And that's just part of it. I mean, I get to be her husband and I get to be your friend. But all of that goes away if we're cut off. I can't imagine my life like that. I know too many pastors who have disqualified themselves from ministry. And now they have nothing to do. They have no direction. And they fall into this deep, deep morass because the life that once was rich and full and had meaning no longer does. As a royal priesthood, every one of us needs to protect that access to the Lord that we've been given. Every one of us needs to protect that access. It was true for the Levites. Under grace, it is even true to a greater degree for you and for me. Back to the text. The one who teaches any such thing will be unclean till evening. Till evening, That's remember, evening starts today in a Jewish calendar. And what he's saying is, look, if you mess up, there's a remedy. The same thing is true for us. If you mess up, there's a remedy. You can come back to the Lord. He must not eat any of the, eat any of the sacred offerings unless he's bathed himself with water. Essentially, he's saying, Levites, practice what you preach. When the sun goes down, he will be clean, and after that he may eat the sacred offerings, for they are his food. He must not eat anything found dead or torn by wild animals and so become unclean through it. Here it is again, I am the Lord. Now we discussed all of that in Leviticus 17, so I'm not going to go back over that territory, but I think the important thing is that we have a way back. If you're here tonight and you're cut off from the Lord, if there are things in your life that render Jesus powerless, and when Paul writes it, we're not to quench the Holy Spirit. Imagine, you and I, we are the only thing on earth that has the power to quench the power of God. The Holy Spirit wants to do a work in you and then through you, and we can strangle it off. We can cut him off. But there's always a way back. One of my very favorite, most comforting verses 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, confess doesn't mean just to say it, but it means to agree with God. God, you are the Lord. You decide what's sin and what's not sin. I don't get a vote. So I agree that what I've been doing is sin. You've been knocking on the door of my heart, and I'm so sorry. 
If you confess your sins, he, God, is faithful and just to cleanse you of all sin. He can wipe it away. But here's the best part of that verse for me. And purify you. It's in the continuous present tense. And purify you from all unrighteousness. Think about that. It doesn't matter what you've been doing. It doesn't matter how long the backslidden car dealer. When the Holy Spirit dealt with his heart, it didn't matter how long he'd been backsliding. It didn't matter what his sins were. God was right there and used that older couple to, to give him an opportunity to come running back. We can always come back home because of grace, wonderful grace. That's why he says the priests are to keep my requirements so that they do not become guilty and die for treating them with contempt. And clearly in the Old Testament, priests died treating them from contempt. By the time of Jesus, the office even of high priest had been corrupted so badly that it was just commonplace. It was normal. But in the beginning, there were men that died. And then he says, I am the Lord who makes them holy. And every time we read this, who makes them holy, it's God saying, I am the Lord who sets them apart for something. That's why the gifts God has given you, the calling God has given you, is so vital. You can't have a rich or vibrant life and certainly no fruit. Jesus promised us an abundant life. That's impossible unless you're allowing the Lord to have his way in your heart. I set them apart. He's the one who does that. This is so personal for me. Um, I've told you the story about one of the men, a relative, who, who was instrumental in leading me to the Lord. And I told him, I'm only six months old in the Lord at this point. I told him, I think the Lord spoke to my heart and I'm supposed to be a pastor. And he just laughed at me. He looked at me and said, look, you're lucky you got saved. Forget being a pastor. God can never use you. It's like, I'm going to get to heaven, but it's going to be the smoking section. But that's simply not true. The calling that we have is such an honor and a privilege. And it's not just for pastors. Your calling as a royal priesthood, your calling as a, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, as a worker, your calling as a Christian, whenever you've been given gifts by the Lord to use, that's a calling God intends you to use, the gifts that he gives you for his glory. And we can always find our way home. Now, verse 9 is simply... Uh, Old Testament way of saying what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, to whom much is given, much is required. And the idea there, as I remind you always, is much more is required. We are all accountable with what God has given us. We're accountable to be stewards for what God has given us. Willful sin could be punished by death. I'm reminded that John writes that there is a sin that leads unto death, one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament but we see that all the way through the Old Testament and in the New Testament on occasion where there was a sin that led to physical death no one outside a priest's family may eat the sacrifice offering nor may the guest of a priest or his hired worker eat it but if a priest buys a slave with money I'll talk about that in a moment or if a slave is born in his household, that slave may eat his food. If a priest's daughter marries anyone other than a priest, she may not eat any of the sacred contributions. The idea of being unequally yoked was just as prominent and prohibited in the Old Testament as it is in the New. But if a priest's daughter becomes a widow or is divorced, yet has no children, and she returns to live in her father's house as in her youth, she may eat of her father's food. No unauthorized person, however, may eat any of it. Now, a couple of things that we need to remember. We remember that the Levites of all of the tribes in Israel had no portion, no inheritance in the land. Forty years, they're walking around in the wilderness. For 40 years, they're waiting for that land flowing with milk and honey. And then when they get there, God says, oh, by the way, you don't get one. And we think, well, that's not fair. I'm sure there were some Levites who thought that wasn't fair. But here's what God said to him: I'll be your portion. I'll be the one who takes care of you. I'll be the one who provides 
for you. And the Levites would honor that. That's what faith is, actively believing, trusting in the promise of God. Now the Levites, like everybody else, and this happened in the book of Judges, will remember. They could have looked around and said, well, everybody else gets to have their own land. Everybody else gets to do these kind of things. Why don't I? And that's just unbelief. That's a lack of faith. And God now is giving the Levites the opportunity to see him move on their behalf. They didn't have to go out hunting food. The Levites were provided food. They got to share the offerings that the people gave to God. Can you imagine how good that must have tasted? And they would take that food home to their family, but it had to be their immediate family. Now, this doesn't mean that the Levites are special. It doesn't mean they're favored. It's just a different calling all together. God always cares for those he calls. And I told you I was going to talk about verse 11 for a moment. I have to do this every time we talk about slavery because there's a lot of unnecessary angst. Because what we want verse 11 to say is, you must not ever participate in slavery. But remember, God is a realist, and slavery was a fact of life in the ancient world. Slaves outnumbered free people, and slavery is still a fact of life. It always has been, and it always will. And there was no racial component at all in slavery as described in our Bibles, whether it was the Old Testament or the New Testament. It was an economic issue. And there were times when there would be people who would be auctioned off and a Levite might buy them, maybe to be kind, maybe to be gracious, maybe just because they needed the help. But please notice that if it was a slave in their home, then that slave could eat the sacred food In other words, God would treat that slave like a part of the family. We get so turned off with the concept of slavery, and rightly so. I wish that we were as upset about modern-day slavery, but we're not. It's just sort of a fact of life. God deals with the real world, and he's letting them know how they can survive and be blessed God hates and condemns slavery. Slave owners are called men stealers in the New Testament and equated with sins that lead to death, horrible sins. But slavery was a fact of life. Paul deals with it. Peter deals with it. I think we have to have a mature Christian approach. It has been so easy if God said slavery is wrong, it's always wrong. We have the same thing with marrying multiple women. God said, don't do it. Humans did it. So we dealt with it. And we have to understand that we simply cannot read our Old Testaments with a 21st century Western perspective. That's why rightly dividing the Word of God is so important. So I hope that makes sense to you. God treats a slave in a home the same way he treats a close family member. Verse 14, if anyone eats a sacred offering by mistake, that's unintentional, he must make restitution to the priest for the offering and add a fifth of the value to it. In other words, there is a penalty even if your sin is intentional. More on that in a moment. The priest must not desecrate the sacred offerings the Israelites present to the Lord by allowing them to eat the sacred offerings, and so bring upon them the guilt requiring payment. I am the Lord who makes them holy. And again, this is why examining our hearts daily matters so much. We all sin. Intentionally, unintentionally, we all sin. And ignorance isn't bliss. If we sin unintentionally, if there's something between you and the Lord, and maybe you're not aware of it, if you will examine your heart, if you'll ask the Holy Spirit to put his finger on those things that are inhibiting your walk with the Lord, I promise you he'll do it. And it's so much better to be able to deal with it quickly, do away with it, make reconciliation if in fact your sin offended or affected other people. It's so easy rather than holding on to it. You know, in church culture, we sort of sin, okay, I shouldn't have done it, but, but then we just hope that it f- sort of fades away, blows over. 
And it never does with the Lord because it's always between you and him until you ask for forgiveness. And remember 1 John 1, 9, all you have to do is agree with him. Say, I'm sorry, I don't want to do it anymore. And then it's as far from you as east is from west and the power of the Holy Spirit is once again available to you. So the Lord said to Moses, speak to Aaron and his sons and all the Israelites and say to them, if any of you, either an Israelite or an alien living in Israel, presents a gift. Now all of these that we're going to be talking about now are free will offerings. Not compelled, but free will offerings. Presents a gift for a burnt offering to the Lord, either to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering. We'll see the difference between those two in a moment. You must present a male. Highlight that, please, a male. Now, this is where the picture of Jesus is being formed. It must be a male without defect or perfect, another translation says, without defect from the cattle, sheep, or goats in order that it may be accepted on your behalf. Do not bring anything with a defect because it will not be accepted on your behalf. When anyone brings from the herd or flock a fellowship offering or a peace offering, it's the same thing, to the Lord to fulfill a special vow or as a free will offering, it must be without defect or blemish, again, perfect, to be acceptable. Now, there's so much here. I'm going to spend most of the rest of our time tonight sort of dealing with this. It has to be a male has to be perfect, without defect. Now, we all know that's a picture of Jesus Christ. If Jesus had one flaw, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. That pronouncement was made three times in three different ways. This is my son, and it was a picture. Jesus was a male. He was without sin he was perfect. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Paul writes that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And the idea is Jesus, the picture of our gift from heaven in Jesus Christ is being drawn for us. And this pattern is important. Why are churches supposed to be led by men? Certainly not because men are smarter. We're not more spiritual. I don't think there's a single advantage we men have over the women. But it's a picture. And it's from Genesis 1-1 all the way through the Bible. And it's all because it's Jesus. Now remember something. And I know this offends some women. I trust not you here because I hope we're a well-taught church. But he's the Lord. It's his picture. He gets to draw it any way that he decides so that it may be accepted. Can you imagine if inspecting Jesus there was one flaw? It's one of the reasons that we have to interpret Genesis, the first 11 chapters, literally. Because if Genesis 1 through 11 is not literally true, then Jesus has all kinds of flaws because Jesus affirmed the book of Genesis. He affirmed that Adam and Eve were the first two people made. He affirmed marriage, biblical marriage, using Adam and Eve. One man, one woman. If that isn't true, Jesus affirmed the flood of Noah. Jesus affirmed all of those things. If they're not true, then Jesus isn't telling the truth. And if he's not telling the truth, then he's disqualified from being our Savior. Every single major doctrine of the New Testament church falls apart if Genesis 1-11 through is not interpreted literally. In the beginning, God. And we've got to decide whether or not we believe it. This picture that God is painting is that important. And if Jesus even once fibbed, if Jesus exaggerated, if Jesus had a sinister motive for anything that he did, then we can't be saved. Now, Malachi dealt with this whole issue in the last book of the, New Te of the Old Testament, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, he wrote this. 
to Israel, he said, you place defiled, this is God speaking through Malachi, you place defiled food on my altar, but you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. Here was the contempt. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? You're giving stuff to me that you wouldn't even give to your governor. And I'm the Lord your God. And this is the way you're treating me with contempt. Now what follows demonstrates that God knows us so well. And God, way back in Leviticus, was preparing for you and me in 2023 because he knows our hearts. I told you earlier, human nature hasn't changed in all of these thousands of years. And God is aware of all of those things. It is true, and it has always been true, that people try to give God that which is not their best. We try to give God the least we can and convince ourselves we're okay. It's almost like we treat God like the IRS. He knows our human nature. And it's shameful to admit that he's right. Every one of us in this room has tried to give God something less than our best and we have tried to convince ourselves that it's okay. But it's like the old couple in the car dealership. The minute God began speaking to their heart, they said, well, we'll take the old car, God. It's fine. And we'll give this family the brand new car. We'll just bless them. I can't tell you over the years how many times people have tried to give us complete junk. We've kind of solved the problem with joy of Jesus now, but for many, many years, you should have seen the clothing that we got wasn't acceptable for anybody and we give it as a gift to the Lord and we act like we're doing something. We've had people offer to give us things. Cars in particular. we got people in the car, single moms especially, that need cars. And we've had people try to give us cars that I wouldn't feel safe driving across the street in. And they act like they're doing God a favor or us a favor by doing it. God always has known that this was the human nature, that this was our propensity. God gave us his best, and he wants to give, or wants us to give him our best as well. No second best, no trying to get away with something that doesn't really cost. Now let me apply that in a way beyond money or, or material property. Your time. You give God the best of your time. You know, I'm a morning person. Everything that I want to do well, I do in the morning. And the reason I do that is because I want to give God my best. You get up in the morning and offer God the rest of your day. Or you just do what it is you're going to do. You just figure, well, I'll catch God on the run. And you're not in the Word. Never makes sense if Jesus said the Spirit of the Lord awakens him morning by morning. If Jesus needed to be awakened in the morning, how much more do we need to be ready to report to God first thing in the morning? He knows what your day holds. You don't know that. He does. Do you give God the best of your time? It's always frustrating when people don't come to church. Again, not here. This isn't an issue with Calvary Chapel. But it's an issue with human beings. And that means there's always some people at Calvary Chapel who are guilty as well. Well, Sunday's my only day off. It really, is it your, your day at all? Well, you know, I would come to corporate prayer, but you know, there are things I need to do on Saturday. We have people in our church who rearrange your whole Sunday schedule based on the time the Cowboys are playing football. 
without checking in with the Lord at all. Now, again, I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty about watching the Cowboys. Okay, maybe I am. <laughs> but do you give God the best of your time? How about your service? I'm going to be really direct here, and this is nothing new for those of you who have been coming for any length of time. Everybody in this church ought to be serving. There's nobody in this church who shouldn't be here for at least two and probably all three services every Sunday. Isn't that harsh? One service to get fed, one service to serve, another service to pray or to serve. If you understand it's not your day, then you understand that. Now, again, I realize how radical that sounds in our church culture, but that's the reality. We want to give God the best that we've got. Now, believe me, there's plenty of time to do your stuff. God's going to make sure you have plenty of time to do the things that you want to do. And he will bless the things you want to do abundantly. But you've got to understand this principle. As we read on, listen to the things that God had to tell them not to give. Verse 22. Do not offer to the Lord the blind, the injured, or the maimed, or anything with warts or festering running sores. Do not place any of these on the altar as an offering made to the Lord by fire. Remember, these are free will offerings. So here's what I'm going to do, God. It's going to be a big sacrifice, but I'm going to give you this blind cow or this sheep that's got festering sores. It's the old story about the farmer who promised God half of everything that he had. And one day, one of his cows had twins. One for God, one for him. That was to fulfill his promise. Well, that night, one of the twins died. And the man went to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm sorry, but your cow died. <laughs> but we do that. We give to the Lord these things, and we do it of our own free will. But, but the problem is we justify ourselves in doing so. You may, however, present as a free will offering an ox or sheep that is deformed or stunted, but it will not be accepted in fulfillment of a vow. Now, the, the difference here is simple. Defects in animals could be offered as free will gifts. It would cost something, but never as a sacrifice for sin or to fulfill a vow. In order to, to sacrifice sin, it had to be perfect. That was the picture of Christ. Or to fulfill a vow to the Lord. Lord, if you do this, I'll do this. We remember the judge, Jephthah. I'll make a vow, Lord. If you give me victory, the first thing that comes out of my house or the first thing that I see, well, that I will give to you. That will be the sacrifice. And when he got back, it was his daughter. Now, don't worry, he didn't kill her. But her plans for being married, the rest of her life was spent for the Lord. She didn't get to enjoy the things that other Jewish girls got to enjoy. And we do that all the time. You must not offer to the Lord an animal. Oh, I'm so sorry. You must not offer to the Lord an animal whose testicles are bruised. This is castration. Farmers know about that stuff. Crushed, torn, or cut. You must not do this in your own land. And you must not accept such animals from the hand of a foreigner and offer them as the food of your God. They will not be accepted on your behalf because they are deformed and have defects. The principle is simple. Give God your best and trust him with the rest. Don't try to figure out how to do it in a way that will be comfortable. If there's a single comfortable Christian here, you're not in the middle of God's will. He never intends for us to be comfortable. Now, remember, these are free will offerings, they're fellowship offerings, they're peace offerings. In the middle of the lack of comfort, in the middle of some of the difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in, there's always a peace. Jesus' personal peace that he gives to us 
as a result of being faithful. That's why Paul said we're to offer our bodies as living sacrifice. I'll close really quickly now, and I've gone way too long. I'm sorry. The Lord said to Moses, "Where when a calf, a lamb, or a goat is born, it is not to re- it is I'm sorry it is to remain with its mother for seven days. From the eighth day on, it will be acceptable as an offering made to the Lord by fire. Do not slaughter a cow or a sheep and its young on the same day. Those were ab- uh, uh, actually." practices that the pagan peoples in Canaan uh, were were practicing uh, in their pagan rituals. God doesn't want them to be the same. When you sacrifice a thank offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. And that's what we want to do. We just come off of Thanksgiving. And, and, you know, we want to be able to say, thank you, God, but it's got to be an offering that that can be accepted on our behalf. You know, Cain and Abel, one presented an offering that wasn't accepted by God, the other an offering that was accepted by God. What was the difference? It was an obedient sacrifice. It was a a thankful, a grateful sacrifice. And the word thank you means nothing if it doesn't match your heart. Must be in the same day, leave none of it till the morning I am the Lord. And then he summarizes the whole thing. Keep my commands and follow them. I am the Lord. Do not profane my holy name. I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who makes you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. And then he closes this chapter with the ninth time. I am the Lord. Why do we keep God's commands? Well, because he's God and because he's holy Because he's the one who sanctifies us. He calls us, but he also sanctifies us for the work. He's the one who provides the Holy Spirit that empowers us. And then we can kind of just take an overview of it all. Because he's the one who brought us out of Egypt. Now, Egypt, a type of the world. He brought his people, Israel, out of Egypt. And God is saying, don't forget that. But you and I, a royal priesthood, We need to remember always that God brought us out of Egypt. I'm not the jerk that I always was. The life that he delivered you from, he rescued you from, why would we ever run back into that life? That's why we listen when he says, I'm the Lord. I have two people in my life. Jesus being one of them, Paula being the other. Jesus, I'm 100% sure he's only and always wanted the best for me. That's all. Paula pretty much has always and only wanted the best for me, apart from when she was praying that I'd die. (laughs) I know their hearts. I can trust them. And that's what God is saying to us. Will you trust me? We take this approach to our Christianity. The Levites did it for law. The Levites did it for meat. How much more are we privileged to be able to say, Lord, you are my Lord. You give orders, I'll obey them. And I'm going to believe every promise. There's absolutely never going to be a time when God is going to fail you. He's good. He's really, really good. And he wants us to trust him so he can prove it to every one of us. Father, as we close tonight, challenge everybody in this room, everybody listening online, Challenge him to to test you on these things.